Well, I'm confident each one of us recognizes that there are two factors meeting and merging, making possible our service this evening. One of these, the providence of God, for which we're profoundly grateful, and the other, the disposition of people just like you, willing to come together and worship the God of our fathers and study from uh, the book we know as the Holy Bible. I join Brother Larry in expressing my appreciation, a deeply felt one, for the coming of everyone. I have been mindful every one of the sermons at how uh, very well you have listened, and I appreciate that, appreciate the warm words of encouragement. I preach because I believe it's my duty and obligation, and it's always been the first love of my life. But it becomes a double joy when people listen as marvelously well as you do. We had a good lunch today, courtesy of uh, Brother and Sister Hagerman, and appreciate that courtesy and that kindness upon their part. Tonight, as I've indicated, we're going to make a study of baptism, asking uh, and answering some questions. Tomorrow night, a study of, I think, my favorite verse in all of the Bible, John 3 and verse 16. The entire lesson will be built upon that beautiful, magnificent, and majestic verse. And then Thursday evening, a Christian, just like the Apostle Paul. Questions asked and answered about baptism. If you think about it, there have been a number of questions related to baptism that are set forth within the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, when John saw the Pharisees and, Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? There's a question asked, and it's in connection with the baptism that John preached. In Matthew, the third chapter, verses 13 and 14, when Jesus came from Nazareth or Galilee to John, unto the Jordan where John was baptizing, he came to be baptized of John. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Another question asked in regard to baptism. In Mark, the 11th chapter and verse 30, Jesus asked a question of his enemies, the baptism of John. Was it from heaven or of men? And this did not receive an answer from his enemies. They knew how to answer it, but they refused to do so. They really and truly knew that the baptism of John originated with heavenly authority, but they were not about to condemn themselves by answering uh, that question fairly and honestly and intelligently. In John the third chapter, Jesus talked to his nighttime visitor by the name of Nicodemus, and the Bible tells us that Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus was talking about the new birth, and the new birth is connected with baptism. And Nicodemus raises the question, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's baptism, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I should have mentioned this before getting to John 3, but in John the first chapter, there is a delegation sent from Jerusalem by the Jewish hierarchy in order to quiz John about his mission and what he was doing. And they asked John in John 1 and 25, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? And so another question asked in regard to baptism. In Acts the second chapter and verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded by telling them to repent and to be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for or unto the remission of sins. Another question asked in regard to baptism. In Acts the eighth chapter, as Philip and the eunuch were traveling along in the chariot, they came to a body of water somewhere there in southwestern Palestine, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? 
another question raised in regard to baptism. In Acts the ninth chapter, Saul of Tarsus asked the question, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And three days later, Ananias is sent to him and told him to be baptized, Acts 22 and 16. In Acts the 10th chapter, verses 47 and 48, Peter said to the brethren that accompanied him from Joppa, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Another question pertaining to baptism. In Acts the 16th chapter, the jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And three or four verses later, we read how that he and his household were baptized. Sometime between uh, when he asked that question and when he and his household were baptized, they were taught the truth about baptism. But it began with a question, Sirs, what must I do in order to be saved? When Paul, on his third missionary journey, met with those dozen men at Ephesus uh, and quickly detected that there was something wrong with their baptism, he said, Under what then were you baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Acts 19, verses 2 and 3. And Acts 22 and 16. And Anas, the God sent preacher to Saul of Tarsus, said, And now why tarriest there, thou? thou? That's a question. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And in Romans the 6th chapter, verses 3 and 4. Know ye not? That's a question. That as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Isn't it amazing how many questions are asked and how many questions are answered about baptism? And tonight I want to raise some very fundamental questions about this very, very important topic. It's an ordinance that most of the religious world rejects as far as its necessity, as far as its connection with baptism is concerned. But simply because they reject it, that doesn't make it untrue or false. It is uh, God's doctrine, it is God's teaching, and we want to raise some questions about the fundamental nature of New Testament baptism. And the very first one that I raise is baptism for everybody. And of course the answer is no. There are some people that are not yet ready for baptism. Little infants who later on will become accountable boys and girls, at that time baptism will apply but it does not apply in their infancy. In 1956, I was preaching and teaching school at Mount Julia, Tennessee, and I had a good friend in the school system who taught agriculture, and he and his wife were expecting their first child about the same time Irene and I were expecting our first one. And they had a little girl born about the same time as our little girl. And just a few days after her birth, he told me one day when we were eating lunch at school that this next Sunday we're going to have little Catherine baptized. There she was, uh, just a very few days of age, and they were going to have her baptized. I thought our little girl won't be baptized until, until she's old enough to be taught, until she's old enough to make the decision on her own. And when she was old enough and uh, knew the truth, I took her confession one day and baptized her into Christ. A vast difference between parents making that decision and people who are old enough and accountable to make that decision. I turned on our television some uh, Sundays ago and the Methodist church there in uh, uh, Ripley had their service televised and I watched as they had a baptismal service. That wasn't uh, the baptism of, an, uh, baptism of an adult, it was a baptism of a little child, perhaps not more than four or six months of age. And whenever the preacher finished the process, after sprinkling a little bit of water upon the child, the child being held in the arms of one of the parents, he said to the parents, she slept through the whole thing, didn't she? Well, that would never have happened in New Testament times. 
people did not sleep through the conversion process because they were very active, active in hearing and believing and repenting and being baptized after making the good confession. And so sleeping through one's baptism belongs to man-made doctrine and not the doctrine of Christ. Again, baptism does not apply to people who will never be mentally capable or mentally competent. Some years back, I preached the funeral for a lady who died in her early 60s, and yet she was never, never mentally competent. Her devoted family waited on her all of her adult years as though she were a little child. She probably never did have the mentality above a three or four year old. Well, baptism, of course, does not apply to a person that is not mentally capable. And of course, a person that refuses to be taught, that refuses to believe, that refuses to repent, that refuses to confess, even if he decided to go through baptism, it wouldn't be New Testament baptism at all. Baptism would not apply if a person is not willing to do what is necessary beforehand. Now, he'll be held responsible, or she will, for refusing this, but nevertheless, a person has to meet some conditions before he is a proper candidate to be baptized scripturally. And then if a person uh, desires baptism but is not really willing to make a full confession, baptism does not apply to him. I have a cousin, Harold Davidson, who now preaches at Oban, Tennessee, and this is the general area where Larry grew up in his younger days. But Harold at one time preached in Midwest City, which is just east of uh, Oklahoma City. And he was telling me about an incident that happened while he preached there back in the early 1970s. He became acquainted with an atheist, and he set up a series of Bible studies with the atheist. Really didn't think that he was making a lot of progress with the man, until one day the man called him up and said, Harold, I want you to meet me at the building. I want you to baptize me right now. Well, this uh, created great joy in the heart of my cousin, and he went to the building and he asked him the same question that I have, that Brother Larry has, and so many others have, ha have asked, namely, do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? The confession that Michael made before us Sunday morning right before his immersion. But when Harold asked the man that question, he began to hesitate. He began to stammer. He said, now Harold, I have some faith in Christ, but at this point I cannot say that I believe with all of my heart that he is the Son of God. What would you have done about baptizing that man? Well, I would have done the same thing that Harold did. He said, you're not ready for baptism yet. You need some more instruction. You need some more teaching and I'll be happy to baptize you when you can say, as the eunuch did, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the man did receive some further instruction, and when his faith was deepened to the point that he could make the right confession, Harold baptized him into Christ. I believe that he did the right thing. Another question, is baptism really the dividing line between the saved and the lost? Well, surely it is. That's why that little preposition is used in connection with baptism. That's why we're baptized into Christ. That's a passing from the outside to the inside. And before baptism, we're still in condemnation. After baptism, we have now come into Christ and are in Christ. That in Christ or in the Lord or in Christ Jesus is an expression or was an expression that Paul really, really loved. I'm told that he used that expression or an equivalent about 169 times in his writings. In obeying the gospel, when we hear, believe, repent, and confess, we're traveling on two. Each step brings us a little bit closer. In baptism, we come into Christ or into the body of Christ or into the church or into the realm of the redeemed. And then after that, the Bible speaks about our being in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. And so baptism is really and truly 
the dividing line between the saved and the lost. And then a third question, does one need to be baptized every time that he sins? We had a man in Tennessee a number of years ago that took that actual position. And this is the way that he reasoned. It was illogical, but nevertheless, he thought it was quite logical. He said, isn't baptism for the remission of sins? And whenever I sin as a child of God, if I'm going to have the remission of sins, I'll have to be baptized every time that I sin. Well, the man had failed to recognize that scriptural baptism is something that we do once, not something that has to be repeated over and over and over again. He failed to realize that a person can sin several times in a day. Jesus said in Luke 17, 3 and 4, that if another sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turns and says, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Well, according to that man's logic, he would need to be baptized seven times for sinning seven times against that brother. He also failed to realize that God has a way of taking care of the sins of his children. I think we're correct in saying that it's his second law of pardon. That's exactly what Peter told uh, the erring Simon. He told him to repent and pray, Acts 8, 22. And John says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And James says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed or that you might be forgiven. James 5 and verse 16. God's second law of pardon is a confession of sin, a repentance of that sin, and a prayer for its forgiveness. And so the man was wrong in saying we have to be baptized every time that we sin. Another question, what happens when a person has, re has received a wrong baptism? Well, if he's received a wrong baptism, he hasn't been baptized scripturally at all. It's simply been a, a ducking or a burial in water with no real baptism occurring at all. It just so happens in Acts the 19th chapter, we have the case of a dozen men at Ephesus in the western part of Asia Minor that Paul contacted and instructed when he arrived in Ephesus uh, the second time. He had briefly visited the city on his second missionary journey, but now on his third journey he comes back for an extended stay. And he immediately begins to question these men. And he wanted to know, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we have not so much as heard whether the Holy Spirit was given. Paul knew immediately that there was something uh, defective about their baptism because New Testament baptism or the baptism of the Great Commission is to be done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He knew that they had, if they had been scripturally baptized, they would have been aware of the Holy Spirit. And when they told him that, Paul said, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And Paul said, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him. Upon receiving this further instruction, these 12 men were baptized scripturally. I have long been of the persuasion that they received John's baptism after it had gone out of effect. It was no longer valid. And as such, uh, they really had not been baptized scripturally at all. And sometimes uh, people need to have this really driven home to them. Not every person's baptism, or what he calls baptism, will take. I've taught a little children's class in local work for about all the years that I've done local work. And a number of years ago, I was teaching uh, the little ones on Sunday night. And uh, we were making a study of the gospel plan of salvation, the importance of hearing and believing and repenting and confessing. And I was spending some Sunday nights talking to them about baptism. And in particular, uh, what baptism is, that is an immersion, and what it's for, that is the remission of sins. And I asked the boys and girls in the class, and they range from about age three to about ages nine or 10, I said, boys and girls, why will sprinkling and pouring not do? Why will it not meet the demands of the Bible? And one little boy, he must have been about five or six years old at the time, 
He said, I know the answer to that, Brother Taylor. And I said, what is it? He said, the power of God is not there. And no gospel preacher could have answered any, any better because the power of God is not in sprinkling and it is not in pouring and it's not even in immersion if that immersion is not formed or unto the remission of sins. People who claim that they have been baptized at one point and then a little bit later on they are immersed as a sign and symbol that they are already saved, the power of God is not there even though they've been buried in baptism. And this gets a lot of people who have received denominational baptism, that's immersion, but a baptism that they believe came after they were already saved. And uh, so that is important to recognize that baptism sometimes does not take. When I and I lived in Ripley, Mississippi in the late 60s and the early 70s, we had Brother E.R. Harper come and hold an eight-day meeting Sunday through Sunday. And Brother Harper had taught school in earlier years in that county. And there were a number of his ex-students who still lived in the vicinity. They learned through our advertising that he was going to be with us. And one of his ex-students uh, called me up and said, we'd like to uh, inform all of Brother Harper's ex-students to come one night and be a part of your service. And if you'll let us have a classroom, we would like to meet with him and uh, reminisce with him and have a period of association with him after the service. And we told them we would be glad for them to do so. And so this man and two or three others began to make calls and uh, they had probably 30 or 40 of his ex-students that came. They sat on the second and third seats in the auditorium. And it just so happened that earlier in the week, Brother Harper announced, on such and such a night, I'm going to ask and answer the question, did your baptism take? And it just so happened that the very night his ex-students came was the night that he planned to speak on that theme. And with the exception of two or three, all of the others in that class uh, of his uh, never had obeyed the gospel. Brother Harper knew that most of them uh, were not members of the church. And if he had been a man-pleasing preacher, he might have said, I can present this sermon tomorrow night, I still have plenty of time, and it might be rather offensive to some of my ex-students if I really hammered down the truth on this thing. But he did not make a single change, and he preached one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard on baptism, and there wasn't a single one of his ex-students or anybody else in that audience who could have gone away and pleaded ignorance about uh, New Testament baptism. He made it just as plain and positive, as crystal clear as any man of our time could have done. And I've always appreciated the courage of this great man of God who decided to preach on what he had announced even though he knew that some of his students might not be in favor of what he was going to say. He knew and uh, he tried to convince them and all of us that if your baptism is not taken, you need to be scripturally baptized. But another question, does the Bible have anything to say about who a proper candidate is? I mentioned the little child that went through a Methodist sprinkling session a little while ago, slipped all the way through it. Obviously, that little child was not a proper candidate for baptism. I mentioned the daughter of the agricultural teacher who was sprinkled early in her infancy. She was not a proper candidate for New Testament baptism. In Bible times, people who were proper candidates were people who had committed sins. Obviously, baptism is not for a person who has never sinned, and the little child that comes into the world is pure and free from sin, and will continue to be pure and free from sin until that child is old enough to be accountable and responsible for his or her condition. And so, uh, an accountable or a proper candidate is one who has sinned and one who has transgressed the will of the Lord. A proper candidate is someone who has believed. Before Jesus mentions baptism in the Great Commission, 
he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The belief comes before baptism. And a proper candidate for baptism is one who is willing to repent. Before Peter mentions, uh, con or before Peter mentions baptism in Acts 2.38, he told them that first of all, as believers, they needed to repent. Repent and be baptized. And a proper candidate for New Testament baptism is one who is willing to make the good confession. I referred to the eunuch a few moments ago who asked the question, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And then he made the good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. By the way, most of the versions of the Bible do not even give Acts 8 and verse 37. I'm glad that uh, the old King James has kept it in. I regret that the American Standard did not keep it in. I was glad that the New King James Version kept it in when they came out with it a few years back. But that confession belongs. It ought never to have been left out of Acts 8 and verse 37. But the eunuch made the good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession the young man made Sunday morning. Lair took it from him, and it was necessary before he took him down into the water and baptized him. And so a proper candidate is someone who has made the proper confession. And then a proper candidate is someone who is ready to be baptized, as the eunuch was, and as Saul of Tarsus was, and others within the book of Acts. Again, does the Bible have anything to say about the proper element? Many people feel like it's the Holy Spirit, and others say, well, it's both spirit and water. We are to receive water baptism, and we are to receive Holy Spirit baptism. Especially among the oneness, Pentecostal holiness people, they claim that there must be water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. One of their main debaters for a number of years before he kind of fell by the wayside was a man by the name of Marvin Hicks. And I have one of the debate books that one of our brethren conducted with him. And in that book, Hicks took the position that he knew of at least 20 million people in our time who have received Holy Spirit baptism. Well, it's something to miss the truth, but 20 million, but that's exactly how much he missed it. There hasn't been one single solitary person ever baptized with the Holy Spirit since uh, the New Testament era, and only a few received it then. And so the proper element is not Spirit or the Holy Spirit. The proper element is water. That's what John baptized in. I indeed baptize you with water, Matthew 3 and verse 11. In John 3 and 23, the Bible tells us that John was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there. And remember what Peter said to the six brethren from Joppa, can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized? Remember what the eunuch said, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Remember what is stated in Ephesians 5 and 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In Hebrews 10, we read about having our bodies washed with pure water, and so water is the proper element. And then another question that I believe to be very vital, does the Bible have anything to say about the right action, whether it's sprinkling or pouring or immersion? Now, many people would say it doesn't make a bit of difference. They would say, well, I can turn to Webster and read how that baptism is sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. But Webster's not giving the biblical definition. He's giving the current definition that people possess and still use. The Bible definition of baptism is an immersion. In fact, it is stated of Jesus that when he came up straightway out of the water, Matthew 3, 15 through 17. Obviously, he could not have come up straightway out of the water unless, first of all, he had descended into the water. It is said in regard to the eunuch that he and Philip went down into the water and baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Speaking of Philip, 
and uh, the eunuch and his baptism, I heard of one very desperate preacher who was trying to eliminate immersion from that picture and get in sprinkling or pouring. He said, why, well, Philip and uh, the eunuch really didn't come to a body of water, that the eunuch had a jug of water there in the chariot with him, and that's the body of water to which he referred. And one of our preachers responded by saying, well, if that be the case, then here's the way the account should have been written. And it came to pass, as they went on their way, they came to a certain jug of water. And the eunuch said, see, here is a jug of water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still or stop. And, it, and uh, both of them went down into the jug of water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the jug of water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Paul makes mention in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, about handling the Word of God deceitfully. And that's a modern manifestation of it. Look at how this man was willing to mistreat and misuse and misapply the scriptures in order to get in a little plug for sprinkling or pouring. I heard of another preacher who was just about as desperate to sustain his case for sprinkling or pouring. He said, well, the Jordan River never was big enough to immerse a person in it. He said, well, I could have dammed up that little stream of water with one of my feet cause one of our preachers to say, oh, I surely would like to have seen one of those fellows' feet. Well, so would I. I've crossed the Jordan River going from west to east and east to west, and uh, I assure you that even John Bunyan's foot would not have been big enough to have dammed up the Jordan River. Remember, it took a miracle for Elijah and Elisha to get across that river and another miracle for Elisha to get back over. If it were a small stream of water that one could dam up a foot, Elijah and Elisha in the early part of 2 Kings could have just stepped over it. They would not have even had to take a running jump. It would have been easy to have stepped over it. But the Jordan River has always been big enough and deep enough for people to be immersed in, and that's exactly why John chose that spot for baptismal purposes. And then another question in regard to baptism, does the Bible tell us the purpose of it? Well, indeed it does. Jesus says in Matthew 28 and 19 that we're to be baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Mark 16 and 16, one is to believe and to be baptized in order to be saved. And Peter tells us in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's the purpose. That's the mission. That's the function of New Testament baptism. And it's only one. That is, in order to be saved for salvation, there are different expressions that are used, but they mean one and the same. Remission of sins is, is the same as being saved. Being saved is the same as being baptized into Christ. Being baptized into Christ is the same as being baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now we have some of our brethren today who will say, well, it's not all that important whether a person realizes it's for the remission of sins or not, just as long as he says it's for a Bible reason. Well, I believe that I can convince a person that it's for the remission of sins as quickly as any of these preachers can convince a person you need to do it just with a Bible reason in mind. It's the Bible reason in mind, and that is for or unto the remission of sins. Another question, when we're baptized, do we actually earn our salvation? I do not believe so, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is still a gift of God, a still a gift of God's grace, but he's not going to save any of us until we obey his will. And then another question about New Testament baptism. Is it really, really essential? Or is it just simply an optional matter? Now let's look at what the Bible has to say. In Matthew 28, 19, 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 8 and 36 and 38, we read about the eunuch who wanted to be baptized. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart that you may, when he made the confession, he and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. In Acts 10 and 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. In Acts 22 and 16, and now what tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In Romans 6, 3 and 4, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ we're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So we also should walk in newness of life. In Colossians 2.12. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. And then in 1 Peter 3.21. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. A number of years ago in West Tennessee, I was studying in some home Bible studies with a couple. The man was already a member of the church, the wife was not. And we were spending some time about baptism. She came from a Baptist background, a very strong Baptist indeed she was. But I knew what her teaching was, I knew what her feelings were, and as we turned and read several passages in the Bible about baptism, I deliberately waited till the very last of the study that night in order to deal with 1 Peter 3.21. I turned to it in my Bible. She turned to it in her Bible. Together we read it. And uh, at the end she said, I see what it says. I know what it says. I just do not believe it. I had an opportunity a while back to talk to her brother-in-law and I said, has your sister-in-law ever obeyed the gospel? And he said, no, she has not. So evidently she still is not a believer in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Now that's about as clear as any person in the Bible ever made it. The like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. If these passages do not demand the necessity of baptism, it would be strange as to why they're even in the Bible in the first place. But another question, does the Bible have anything to say about the connection between water baptism and the blood of Christ? Well, indeed it does. We're told in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed, connected with the blood. But remember in Acts 22, 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus shed his blood in his death. Paul, John makes that clear in John the 19th chapter. Well, how do we get into the benefits of his death? Paul tells us in Romans 6, 3 and 4 that we're baptized into his death. Hence, it is a baptism into the death that permits our sins to be washed away by the blood of the Son of God. Another question, what about Lordship Baptism? I had been preaching for a number of years before I ever, ever heard that expression. And when I first heard it, I found myself asking, I have, I think at one time or another, preached on every verse in the New Testament about baptism. I knew, I, had, I knew that I had memorized every passage in the New Testament about baptism, many of which I've quoted tonight in the lesson. And it just occurred to me, I've never read anywhere in the Bible where any writer ever talked about lordship baptism. Well, the reason I couldn't find it in the Bible is because no New Testament writer ever put it in the Bible. It had its beginning down in Florida, 
and especially the Crossroads Doctrine. The men connected with that movement began to say to college students in mass that in all probability when you were baptized as, as young people, you only accepted Christ as your Savior, and you really and truly did not accept him as your Lord, and therefore you need to be baptized accepting Christ as Lord, hence Lordship Baptism. There was a preacher in West Kentucky a number of years ago. He sent me his bulletin, and I had known him from his early days as a preacher, but he got caught up in crossroads. And uh, he wrote in his art bulletin article one week, he said, this is how long I've been a Christian, this is how long I've been preaching, and yet it's only been within recent days that I have made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Now how in the world can a person be a Christian and not make Jesus the Lord of his life? The truth about the matter is Jesus does not come in piecemeal fashion. He's not a cafeteria Christ where we go down the line and pick out what we want and reject the rest, but that's what they try to do in saying that you can accept Christ as Savior at one point, but later on you might need to accept him as the Lord of your life. He comes as Lord and Savior and all the other designations mentioned of him or else he does not come at all. A sermon I sometimes preach in gospel meetings, I call it the comprehensive Christ. And I suggest in that lesson that we accept the entirety of Christ. We accept the complete Christ. We do not accept just a partial Christ. And that's what the Lordship Baptism advocates made their mistake in this matter. Another question, what about proxy baptism? That is baptism where one does it in behalf of another. This has long been Mormon doctrine. I have a book in my library that tells about one Mormon lady, and she said, I have been baptized for between 30 and 40. Now, she didn't say 30 or 40 people. She said for between 30,000 and 40,000 people. Well, they immerse people, so she had spent a lot of time in being uh, taken down into the water and being immersed. She said, I have even been baptized for Alexander the Great and for Julius Caesar. Well, even if the doctrine were correct, she could have saved those two because Alexander lived a long, long time before baptism was ever commanded. And Julius Caesar was already dead and in his grave a long, long time before Jesus gave the Great Commission. And so she could have saved at least those two. But proxy baptism is not New Testament baptism. The Mormon people have been baptized for literally millions and millions of people. And they believe that their doctrine, when it is done by a living Mormon, that it can benefit those who are dead, who were never baptized. That may be proxy baptism, but it's not New Testament baptism at all. The last question, does the Bible have anything to say about how prompt our response to baptism ought to be? Well, I believe that it does. On the day of Pentecost, they were baptized promptly. In the case of, Corn in, in the, case of the eunuch, he was baptized promptly. In the case of Saul of Tarsus, there was a three-day interval, but this is simply because the Lord waited three days to send the preacher to tell him what to do in order to be saved. As soon as the instructions were given, the Bible tells us that Saul arose and was baptized, Acts 9 and verse 18. In the case of Cornelius' and his household, they were baptized immediately. In the case of the jailer and his household, they were baptized sometime after midnight. In the case of Lydia and her household, they were baptized right there at the river, or in the river. They had met by the riverside a little bit earlier in that chapter. In the case of the 12 men at Ephesus, when Paul taught them the truth, they were baptized promptly. A number of years ago, I was preaching in a meeting over in your neighboring state uh, of Ohio and Columbus, and uh, they had been working with a number of people and had several prospects for the meeting. And one night in particular, we had about five or six, most of them adults, that responded in order to make the good confession and be baptized. But the brethren were disappointed that there was one man that they fully expected to be in that number when the others began to come down the aisle. 
but he let the uh, he let the service close and he did not respond but sometime after midnight the local preacher I was staying with him and his family during the meeting he received a call from this fella sometime after midnight maybe one or two in the morning and he said would you and brother Taylor meet me at the building I want to be baptized right now and we met him at the building his confession was taken and the local preacher baptized him into Christ I was in a meeting a while back in West Virginia and had something of the same situation develop and uh, uh, I preached a lesson along this line on the necessity of baptism and the congregation had been working with a young man who came from a Catholic background and they thought that he was pretty close to being baptized but he decided not to when the invitation was extended that night but a little bit later on that evening he called the preacher and said would you and brother Taylor meet me at the building I want to be baptized right now well that's how urgent he considered the matter to be when he got home and evidently could not sleep and I'm glad that he had a sleepless night that night and uh, would not fall asleep until he had done something that he should have done uh, even before but that's how urgent uh, baptism is not something that one ought to put off I believe every question that we've discussed tonight is fundamental and uh, is applicable and certainly one that we need to think seriously about if you've never been baptized scripturally you need to be a hearer a believer a penitent person one who's ready to confess your faith and then be baptized in strict harmony with the teaching of the Bible not in harmony with man-made doctrines about baptism but simply be baptized now as they were then and you'll be added to the same body of the saved as they were then if you've never obeyed the gospel and we may we encourage you to do so while we stand and sing